So next up, we have another brilliant panel before we head into our lunch hour. Moderating for this next session is Rebecca Kaiser. She is an experienced associate deputy administrator. Uh, she has a history of working in aerospace, science policy, and international relations. Uh, she's very uh, skilled at uh, strong, strategic, professionally, uh, garnered partnerships. Uh, this crosses both the private and government sectors. Uh, she's been involved in international negotiations, uh, procurement, uh, intelligence analysis, uh, you name it, I believe she may just do it. So please welcome Rebecca and her entire uh, team to our panel today. Come on in. Take a look. We'll do that. That's all. We'll do it that way. This is perfect. <laughs> Good morning slash afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I am Rebecca Kaiser, and it's an absolute pleasure to see you all today, and we have a wonderful panel. This topic of international collaboration and space exploration is very timely indeed, and my boss, the director of the National Science Foundation, is actually testifying on the Hill right now about the Event Horizon Telescope finding the picture of the black hole, which was an exemplary example, if I can say that, of uh, international collaboration with ex amazing contributions from Japan, Taiwan, Europe, and really across the globe. We can't really do space exploration these days without international collaboration, so I look forward to our conversation. We're going to start uh, with some introductory comments from each of our panelists about their role in international collaboration and deep space exploration and how they actually work on this topic. So let me start here with Ryan Whitley, the Director of Civil Space at the National Space Council. If you can give us some of your thoughts about how you work on this topic of international collaboration and deep space exploration. Thanks, Rebecca. really appreciate it. Um, yes, yeah, so um, at the Space Council, we deal with all things and all space domains for, for the White House. And so, um, as I think many of you know, uh, space exploration, deep space exploration, is, a, is an important topic for, for the White House. Uh, the big first space policy directive that came out of the Space Council um, was about exploration. And I'll just read it real quick because I think it really sums up um, what we're looking for for, for partnership, is, is lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners to enable human expansion across the solar system and to bring back to Earth new knowledge and opportunities. Beginning with missions beyond low Earth orbit, the United States will lead the return of humans to the moon for long-term exploration and utilization, followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. So some key words there, moon and Mars, beyond LEO, international and commercial partners. So clearly, this is you know, the White House directive to say, this is part of the plan, this is what we want to see. So now it's about implementing that. And so that's kind of what the next steps are, is figuring out you know, what, what does that mean for, um, for, for exploration, both robotic and human. And so um, I think many of you know that you know, just a, a few weeks ago, about almost, well, almost about two months ago, um, you know, we had a charge from the vice president to expound on this and, and set some urgency for getting back to the lunar surface in five years. And so the question may be, you know, what does that mean for our, our partnerships? And I guess you know, the way I'd sum that up is it means that we need to have that same sense of urgency around building those partnerships around these, these shared visions. And fortunately, uh, the moon um, is, is, a, is a shared vision. I mean, Mars is too, but um, as the largest spacefaring nation, um, the means to get to Mars is more within the US sphere than it is in these other nations. And so they understand the importance of involving the moon on that path. And so, you know, if we focus on, on those partnerships, include both our um, current ISS partners that are, that are really strong, 
um, in our both Moon and Mars planning, extending that forward, and also looking at new partners. There's, there's, there's developing nations um, like India, Brazil, South Korea, UAE. We want to involve them as well. So we're going to all, you know, we have conversations, and, and, and the White House works to, to meet and, and discuss these, these opportunities. Um, and Leo is not, you know, not gone, right? We, we were talking about deep space in this panel, but Leo is still important. And so as we transition from ISS to future other platforms, that's important too. We want to have partnerships, partnerships in Leo. So the future, um, just real, real quickly, about where we want to focus our partnerships is is, is going to be around this vision that the vice president. Um, outlined is, is around the moon. And so that's two spheres, you know, the Lunar Gateway, which we've already identified some of those opportunities already, which are great, we wanna build on those, and then also on the lunar surface. So we wanna have um, one day um, being side by side with our allies on, on the surface of the moon. That is, that is the dream, that is the goal. So how we work towards that is, is the work before us. So, Thank so thanks. Much, Ryan. Masami Onoda is director of the uh, Washington DC office of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. And Masami-san, can you talk to us a little bit about your role in international collaboration and deep space exploration? Um, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, so let me start with a little bit of history. Um, and it, on July 31st, 1969, uh, that is exactly the year um, and just weeks um, after the Apollo 11 uh, moon landing. Uh, the Japanese and U.S. governments signed an exchange of notes on space cooperation, and so that led to the establishment of um, JAXA, then called the National Space Development Agency of Japan, uh, which was established on October 1st, 1969. Um, and so U.S.-Japan civil space cooperation today covers a wide range of activities. And uh, also we've built very close cooperation with agencies, space agencies and countries worldwide, um, Europe and elsewhere in the world and Asia. And we are really excited to be part of the um, deep space exploration efforts, of course. Um, my role in Washington, D.C. as the uh, JAXA representative is to, of course, represent JAXA and in some parts uh, the Japanese uh, ministries as a whole, uh, as we are the central Japanese um, space agency. And uh, we do interact a lot with all of the colleagues here, um, with the White House and State Department and the AIA, the industry, daily. Um, so that's what we do, and we closely, of course, follow the U.S. policy, um, and we do try to align with that and be part of the international um, deep exploration uh, policy and uh, programs, because uh, no country alone can do this. So, um, and the Japan-U.S. space cooperation, as you all know, is um, supported from the top level of uh, both countries. Uh, last year in November, <coughs> Vice President Pence uh, met with our, our Prime Minister. Um, they talked about space and this was um, a press release um, to strengthen uh, comprehensive space cooperation, including security industry and science and technology. Um, and so this uh, had been the basis for supported the um, revision of our roadmap of our basic plan for space policy um, to uh, newly include um, activities on international space exploration. And uh, the Prime Minister also, Abe, also um, instructed to advance international coordination so that Japan can make a contribution with its technology to participate in the Lunar Gateway. Um, and uh, this year, uh, as you all might know or might not know, um, we have uh, the Japanese um, era. And uh, this uh, May 1st, we entered into a new era with the enthronement of our new emperor. Um, it's moved from Heisei, formally, to Reiwa now. Um, and uh, so this uh, is really positive in Japan. Um, and we are also, with this new era starting, we are expecting the uh, President of the United States to be visiting us in a few weeks. This is all very exciting and very positive. And along those lines, I think um, space exploration is uh, the most positive topic that we have in between both countries to discuss. Um, and 
also which would, uh, in other aspects, support national security um, and the stable um, situation, um, international situation in the region um, in broad terms. So this is very important as well as positive for us and we very much look forward to this um, and uh, we would like to expand further our cooperation, uh, not just with the US, but with all international partners. Thanks. Thank you, Masami-san. Chris Canazaro is uh, from the Office of Space and Advanced Technology at the U.S. Department of State. So when we think of international relations, we think of the Department of State. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you do this regarding deep space exploration. Sure. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, obviously, I'm not Dave Turner. Uh, Dave, Dave got called away for some international negotiations in Europe. Uh, so I, I'm actually a former engineer uh, working at the State Department. I'm, I'm our lead for uh, space exploration uh, applications and te technology in the office. Um, as space is uh, an international doma domain, of course. Uh, we play an important role in strengthening the U.S. leadership in space by advancing our U.S. national policies and programs through international <laughs> engagement and encouraging the use of U.S. space capability systems and mutually beneficial uh, cooperation. Uh, our office, we have primary responsibility for U.S. representation to the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or COPUS. I think many of the people here are familiar with COPUS. Um, established in 1959, uh, it developed the Outer Space Treaties and the, um, and the three related conventions. And uh, which are generally considered to be the, ben the bedrock of international, the international space governance uh, framework. Uh, our office also, also organizes and or leads a number of government to government, uh, let's say whole of government space policy dialogues with all of the leading spacefaring nations. We, we look forward to hosting Japan for what will be our sixth comprehensive dialogue in, in, in July. Uh, we also have dialogues with India, Europe, through the European Commission, uh, and, and even, with, uh, even with China, focused on space flight, si focused on space flight safety and uh, long-term long uh, sustainability issues. Um, we've also recently been engaging, engaging with a number of the emerging space faring countries. So, for example, a few months ago, we, we hosted uh, our, our first dialogue with Indonesia. Um, I, I think. The State Department is, is a member of the Space Council, or Secretary of State, uh, and uh, we are actively advancing uh, each of the uh, President's space policy directives, certainly the international components, and perhaps we'll, maybe, I'll stop there, maybe we'll get into those a little bit later. Sure. Well, thank you, Chris. And Dak Hardwick, um, Assistant Vice President for International and Acting Vice President for Space for the Aerospace Industries Association, AIA. Can you talk um, also about how AIA plays in this, uh, especially representing private industry? So Rebecca, thank you, and uh, obviously a pleasure to be here today. The Aerospace Industries Association represents nearly 340 members of the aerospace and defense sector here in the United States. Uh, we've been one of the leading advocates for not only greater civil space funding, but space funding across the board in order to realize a vision that we put out this year uh, so this year we're celebrating our 100th anniversary, and we put out a, um, a document called Vision 2050. And it really is one of these uh, defining documents that looks forward 30 years about what technologies are going to change our way of life. And I can tell you of the Vision 2050 document, the research that went into that, almost every single one of those technologies that is going to change our way of life is somehow either space-based or space-enabled. And uh, when you start to think about that, uh, you really understand how important just the general funding is. And so as an association, we continue to be very supportive of a lot of the investment you see both on the public side and on the private side. Um, specifically, uh, representing the industry is very interesting because the, the pathway to Mars actually runs through the industry. And the great example that I will use here is uh, many of us were attended the Apollo 11 a film premiere that was on uh, Tuesday evening with the vice president. And there's a scene in the movie uh, that shows um, all of the companies that were supporting Apollo 11, and it has, it's, it's the engineers, and they have their white lab coats on, and you see the, the logos of those companies on the backs of those engineers. And it's Boeing, and it's, it's Grumman Aircraft Corporation, which is now Northrop, which is part of Northrop Grumman now, and it's 
Rockwell, and it's just, and, and all of those engineers and all of those contractors literally built the machines that took us to the moon. And that is going to happen again. So the contractors and the engineers that are bending metal, that are uh, going through all of the uh, uh, just engineering challenges, all of that is gonna be done by industry. Uh, there's an example, there are many examples of how internationally we did that as part of, uh, as part of Apollo 11 or part, as part of the Apollo mission, but ultimately for the international uh, portion going forward to get back to the moon and get to Mars, there's gonna be an increased international, increased international aspect to that. So, um, you know, AIA is able to speak frankly to the, the supply chain that is required to get back to the moon. Mm. So it's not just your large integrators. It's not just the companies that you know that are on the It is parts and components that are made by suppliers in counties and cities in this country that you don't even know exist. And they are part of the space industrial base and they are feeding those parts and components in. It is entrepreneurial. Um, it is breaking through technology in a way that we haven't seen in the past. Uh, and uh, the industry, uh, AIA, is very happy to represent the entire range of that supply chain from the largest integrators to the smallest suppliers. Um, in terms of international space collabor collaboration on the industry side, frankly, it's in our DNA. It, it really is. Um, the best example here is um, if, if there are any uh, Canadians in the room, you will appreciate the fact that uh, the LEM lander legs were built in Canada. Um, you will appreciate that the telemetry and the data that was used to pull the Christmas Eve message for Apollo 8 was channeled through relay stations in Australia. And those are just some basic examples of at least international collaboration we did for Apollo. Uh, I can tell you going forward that we are the only way to get back to the, the only way to get back to the moon and the only way to get to Mars is through international collaboration. And I'll, and I'll leave you with this. Uh, for those of us that watch the Mars series on Nat Geo, or you read Andy, any Andy Weir novels, uh, how many of them indicate that only the United States will be the country that will go to Mars? And the answer is none of them. There, it's, it's almost assumed that in order to get to Mars, we will have international collaboration. I think that's right. And on the industry side, because we have a global supply chain that supports our aviation sector, that same global supply chain is going to support our space sector as we get from the moon, to the moon and back to, and to Mars. So I'll stop there. Thank you. We'll Excellent forward. point about the whole ecosystem and supply chain being global. And we, we think about formal collaborations, but it's another huge aspect of international connection. So industrial partnerships obviously are important. Uh, the aerospace sector has traded tariff-free mm. for almost 40 years. And we have seen tremendous international growth. Uh, it has allowed the, the US economy to expand greatly in the aerospace sector. And frankly, it's seen international collaboration or international um, supply chain uh, suppliers rise up through countries that uh, are emerging and continue to emerge. And the US aerospace and defense sector is frankly uh, excited to take advantage of those supply chain and the, and the technology that is existing in those countries. Very nice. So let's talk about things that work well in international collaboration. Um, Chris, can you talk about some examples of international collaboration and deep space exploration, some things that have worked well in this arena? Well, well, sure. I mean, well, we, we, have the, we have the obvious example of the International Space Station. We always, we always point to the uh, tremendous work that is, uh, well, how well all of the partners work together on the space station. and. Uh, the technologies as a proven ground for going beyond the low Earth orbit. Um, and I think, of, of course, we have a number of great examples in the robotic space exploration sphere. And the one that I always look to is the, uh, the Mars Science Laboratory with the Curiosity rover. Uh, I was just, did a, a bit of research on that and um, well, so all, all of those agreement, all of NASA's international agreements come through our office for processing and, and um, looking at. Uh, I, I see that there are 10 scientific payloads on the, on the Mars Scientific Lab Laboratory and that over 400 international scientists working on there. And I know we have instruments from uh, France and Germany on, on there and several other countries. So that, that would be one example I would give. 
That's excellent. And Masami san, can you talk about some of JAXA's international collaborations or some other examples that you could point to? Yes, um, ask the space agency to advertise. <laughs> um, we have all these satellites. Um, uh, we are all, of course, very excited when Hayabusa 2 successfully um, touched down on the target asteroid, Ryugu. Um, that was this February. And then it made its uh, artificial um, crater on the asteroid in April. And Hayabusa 2 is a joint international mission. Um, the mascot lander last October landed on, uh, landed on uh, Ryugu, jointly developed, um, and this was jointly developed by DLR and CNES. And this was released from Hayabusa 2 and made a successful landing on the asteroid. Uh, we will also cooperate with OSIRIS-REx um, mission of the US by exchanging the Ryugu samples with the Bennu samples that uh, OSIRIS-REx will collect. And our science team also reported that Hayabusa 2 has detected small amounts of minerals containing water on the surface of the asteroid Ryugu. So we really look forward to its return uh, to Earth in 2020. Um, in October last year, uh, Mercury uh, Magnetospheric uh, or Orbiter MMO, which is nicknamed MEO, and uh, Mercury Planetary Orbiter MPO were launched on Bepi Colombo, a cooperation with ESA. Um, and also, uh, so this uh, will, it will take seven years approximately to get to Mercury, and it will stay there, carry out observations for about a year. Uh, JAXA also planning the Mars Moon, uh, Moon sorry, Mars Moon uh, sample return, MMX, uh, currently aiming for launch in 2024, which will also be a global collaborative mission in its development in operations and science. Uh, this May 1st at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, just close to here, uh, JAXA joined the uh, Goddard team for the selection uh, event of CESAR, a comet um, exploration and sample return mission. Um, we hope that this will be chosen for the NASA's new Frontiers program. Um, now, currently, we are in competition with uh, Dragonfly, a mission to Saturn's moon Titan. So uh, the, the, uh, if this uh, is all successful, uh, we have this um, uh, uh, ambition that uh, we will have samples coming back to Earth every 10 years. This is such a grand thing to go on. So from, first from an asteroid, and then from Mars, Moon, and then from a comet. So this is what we envision in the next 30 years. Thank you. Hayabusa is particularly uh, uh, resonant with me as my NASA colleague Mark Allen and I signed the, uh, the original Hayabusa agreement with Japan on the launch pad for Hayabusa 1, so phew, um, we did it, uh, which shows one potential challenge to international collaboration, and it's getting the formal agreements in place. And of course, we depend on Department of State to help us in that regard, and they do a very good job. But I was wondering, Dak, if you could talk about what you see as a few of the other challenges uh, that we face regarding international collaboration in space. Absolutely. And so um, not only do I come at this from the space side, I also come at it from the international trade side. And uh, technology transfer and collaboration when, and technology going forward. And those of us that work on technology transfer understand that we have a gold standard regime here in the United States about uh, the international traffic and arms regulations and the U.S. munitions list. And those of us that deal with export controls understand that in category four and category, fight, uh, category 15, dealing with launch and then human space flight, there are certain restrictions about technology transfer that uh, under U.S. law we have to abide by. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the last administration and I think this administration are conscious of the need to continually evaluate and reevaluate the emergence of technology, uh, the challenge will always be is that technology will always outpace regulation, always. And it's making sure that we have the right level of flexibility to change the way in which we apply that technology, especially when we're getting into partnerships with international, with, with international partners. Um, I like to tell this story just because I use it as an example of what not to do. Um, so I was a space camp kid. So I went to space camp when I was in seventh grade, right? So I'm lucky enough to not only do some, 
Uh, I, I wanted to be an astronaut, right? And I figured out when I was very young that I did not do very well at math, so engineering probably wasn't my, uh, wasn't my direction. Um, but uh, I got to go back to the Space and Rocket Center uh, uh, last year, year before. It's the first time I've been back in about 30 years. And uh, met with the folks at Space Camp and had a very nice visit. Well, about two months after I was down there, uh, one of the officials at Space Camp called me and they said, well, do you do export control? And I said, unfortunately, I do. <laughs> and um, he said, um, we have some visitors coming in from another country. We have a display in the museum of some of the technology that was used to take us to the moon. And we are being told that we have to take the exhibit down because it displays technology that has not been transferred under US law. <laughs> 50 years ago. And so the pace of technology and the, and the the regulatory environment has to keep up with each other. Again, I think in, in, in launch and then human spaceflight, we're making, we're making some good, yeah. good um, but, but it continues to be a challenge. And it will always be a challenge. And so for those of us on the industry side, um, we will always ask our government the question. And uh, because ultimately uh, it is the international partners that are asking us the question. Yeah. And we wanna make sure that we get to the we get to the right answer as quickly as we can because that is where the international collaboration starts. So, so export control, Chris, of course I have to turn to you. Um, do you have any thoughts on that topic or any other challenges we have to sure. international collaboration? So uh, my, my office is not directly engaged in the State Department's export control. Uh, well, we're, we're indirectly involved, but not directly, but um, there is a, a lot of good work happening that, in that area by my colleagues and across the, uh, the government and commerce and, and the Department of Defense under the uh, SPD2. And we heard, we heard about um, some, of those in, some, of those in, uh, some of that progress at the last Space Council meeting and maybe Ryan will maybe talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, I think another, another challenge with space exploration is the, uh, the huge cost involved in getting the political buy-in for space exploration. Um, NASA enjoys a lot of, has, a, has broad authority in the US, but many of our international, many of the international other space agencies or our partners don't enjoy such broad authority. And so to elevate space within their country uh, does sometimes entail uh, engaging with more senior officials within their government and, and getting that political buy-in. Uh, and and, and one, one area where the State Department together with Europe and Japan uh, tried to help in that regard was to create the International Space Exploration Forum, or ICEF. The Department of State hosted the first ICEF in, in 2014, uh, ministerial level dialogue on space, um, bringing together not just the space agencies, but also the ministries, the Ministry of Science and, and foreign ministries. And uh, we were very fortunate to have Japan pick up the mantle and host the second ICEF in, in 2018. And, uh, Europe has committed to host a third ISEF uh, in 2020, 2021. And, and we think that's, that's really important to have that, that political support when we're talking about billion dollar investments over decades. And Ryan, I know that Space Council has been working diligently on this issue of regulation and balancing the, the right around of, of regulation for space exploration. Do you want to talk about that or any other efforts that, that uh, you're undertaking to improve collaboration and improve space exploration overall? Sure, sure. Yeah, Chris alluded to the last Space Council meeting, and uh, it, we are working actively on the export control reform. And so that's an ongoing process. We had a list of recommendations, and we're moving forward on those. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big task for us. Um, DAC's story was actually very applicable because you know there are ones that we need to fix, and there's others we need to maybe strengthen. So it's, it's a balanced portfolio. We have to figure out what the right, right level is, um, but it's definitely a major focus of, of the council. I would say, you know, since we're at a Humans to Mars Summit, um, you know, talk about the human exploration side of this a little bit. Um, that, is, that is, you know, we've had wide success with, with the ISS. Um, and it's been this great 
this great thing. We have something called the Internet Government Agreement that has shaped that. Um, it's, it's a very long document that kind of spells out um, the relationships between the, the different ISS partners. And the challenge, I think, before us for human exploration is identifying how that is useful for going forward, how we bring in the moon and Mars exploration to those spheres. Um, you have different agreements with different nations and how those barter arrangements work out. Um, we've started that with the, um, at the working level and the, and the Lunar Gateway activity, and we want to expand that. We want it to, to go beyond that. Um, and like Chris mentioned, we're talking billions of dollars of investment. So it has to make sense um, for each uh, nation and how they engage in that, how they um, you know, identify which industries are going to serve those, those, those um, projects, and then how they fit together in a, in a piece because we're gonna, we now become dependent on each other. So um, this gets really complicated and potentially difficult um, as you work across the government spheres. So on a technical level, um, maybe it's pretty straightforward. You're like, yeah, I see that hole. I, we, need, we need that module. Yes, great, let's do it. And then you have to you know, actually get the governments involved and, and make those agreements. In the end, it's, it's, it's entirely worth it. I mean, exploration together is, is worth the endeavor, but it's hard work. And it, 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 takes, it takes people who are willing to, to make those um, sacrifices to, to reach across the aisle and say, yes, come with us, and let's, let's figure out how to do that. But I think going forward, it's how do you bring those other spheres of deep space exploration into, into focus and, and get those governments to invest in, in, those, in, those, um, in those industries and noting that everyone has their government cycle. We have our, our cycles here um, in Congress and, and administrations. Europe has you know, tons of countries to, to, um, to deal with and organize. Um, and you know, you can, I've even heard stories about how, how Japan works and how difficult it can be to get consensus on things. So the, every nation has, has their challenges to, to get together that consensus. And so I think those are the, the big challenges going forward for human exploration. Ryan, where do you see, if you could paint for us kind of a vision of, of the future in space exploration and how international partnerships might play in that, um, what would that vision look like? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, in the long term, Mars, Mars is where we want to be. I think that, you know, uh, what Dak illustrated about Hollywood and how we portray it, I mean, that's the reality, right? We are, we are a global society. Now, um, uh, we also have um, nations, and those nations have interests. And so we, you know, every nation wants to do these great things. And so you're seeing that in our country today, this reinvigoration um, from, from the administration focused on space. And so there is, you know, from, from the White House perspective, we want to lead, we want to lead the parade, right? So we want to be part of this parade where we all go out together. And so I think, um, like I said before about ISS transitioning to other um, arenas, we want to have those partners every step uh, along the way. And so that's going to be around, around the moon. And that's the near-term thing, I think, for humans is, is, is around the moon. Now, robotic you know, collaborations will continue indefinitely, and I think those are great. I mean, there's, there's a number of new Mars ones. You know, at the Mars summit, so I'll you know, highlight those. I mean, there, there's the uh, ExoMars and then the InSight um, activities that are our major uh, partnerships uh, across international circles. I think those can be springboarded into the larger Mars partnership. But in the end, for the humans, um, it's going to take um, those broader agreements and, and focus areas, and we have to really be um, careful and, 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 and specific about where those collaborations occur because, you know, as, as administrations change, as those things morph, we, have, we can maybe lose sight of that. So, but in general, I think um, the, the moon in the near term, Mars in the long term is where, is where we're heading for, for exploration, never leaving LEO. So that's a big portfolio <laughs> and, uh, you know, with limited budgets, that's, that's the challenge. Great. And Masami-san, how do you view international collaboration in the future? In the future? Um, so, of course, as everybody says, um, going out to deep space, we cannot do this alone. And so international collaboration is probably a given. Uh, that said, uh, it strikes me, so I arrived here last July, so it hasn't been a year yet. Uh, as we just talked, we, I get to experience the wonderful shutdown also. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it, it strikes us really, the, uh, and I didn't know, I knew it by knowledge, but I didn't feel it until I came here, how different the decision-making process is um, in, like if we take Japan and the US, and I'm sure Europe also has its own way of decision-making in all the individual countries. Um, imagine 
putting together 27 or 28 together. Um, but uh, so a, each of us have so much difference. Uh, for instance, in the US, so you have this um, democracy um, that where you have um, to uh, continuously individual different parts of the government or justice, uh, they, they um, try to um, uh, balance by correcting each other. That is how I understand it. Um, and uh, in Japan, though, ours is much more incremental. I hear a lot of laugh. <laughs> but, um, so uh, my 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 so observation is Japan very very incremental. We hate surprises. We love to plan, um, <laughs> and uh, so so I think everyone in in diplomacy at all would know this, and uh, and the U.S. of course continuously surprises us. Um, <laughs> And so, um, <laughs> so. <laughs> I know. so um, but, but still, we have to work with each other, and we love to work with each other. Um, like when there was a shutdown, we had a problem on export control, where our, so we have in 2000, fiscal year 2020, we have the plan to launch our new launch vehicle, H3. And in H3, uh, we will have these compon components that we have to um, import from the US, and we had to um, have this export control um, um, cleared by a certain timeline. And this, because of the shutdown, was delayed and we had serious problems. Uh, we could just um, immediately uh, call up our friends in the government and see what's happening. And although it was, of course, shut down, the people tried to work with this as much as it could. And we did meet the deadline, so it did not impact our development. Um, but this, this, at every level, um, we need international, very close, friendship and cooperation and communication um, and to overcome this in the grander view in um, our moon landing and gateway and then further on to Mars. Um, we hope to understand each other and to put together this in a way that we can then put together our technology and to um, tackle this challenge together. Excellent points, thank you. And Dak, from the private sector perspective, uh, how do you see the future uh, with international and space exploration? So um, it's, it's certainly very positive. Like I said, the, the, uh, the pop culture references, I, I think, are a given for all of us. Um, I want to go back to one thing that's one of the challenges that we haven't talked about. And it's something <clears throat> that is, is unique to the aerospace sector, but it's not unique to the United States. Mm -hmm in that we are in a global race for the talent that will build the machines that take us to Mars. And let me use, let me use an example, not to disparage a, a large company in which is a cell phone uh, provider or a, a telecommunications <laughs> company. But uh, during the, the NCAA basketball tournament, I was watching the, watching the game and there was a commercial that came on and the first, commercial, and the, the first image on the commercial was Buzz Aldrin standing on the moon. And I thought to myself, wow, this is going to be an amazing commercial for, uh, for one, of, one of the AI member companies or um, you know, one of the, the partners, the international partners that we work with or whatnot about going to the moon and going back to Mars. And the, and the commercial went like this. We, on, on, in this world, we can do anything we want. We stood on the moon, and this is why you should buy Verizon. <laughs> so I use it as an example because... Um, our friends in Silicon Valley, who are pushing the edge on technology, have cornered the market on the concept that that is the only place to go if you want to change the world. And we, we change the world in the aerospace sector. We not only change it, we also go visit other worlds. And we, have, uh, we are in a race for that talent. And it doesn't start at the, um, the post-secondary education level. It starts at pre-K, it starts at K through 12, and, it's, and it continues on through college. The, the conversation that we talk about in, about workforce is if we don't have them, if we don't have those students, by the time they go to college, they're lost. We have already lost them because they don't have the fundamental skills to be able to be the next engineer, to be the best technicians. And it's not just engineers. We need skilled tradespeople that understand how metal and electricity flows through that are just experts in those areas. We had that 50 years ago, and we've lost some of that trade skill. 
We need to bring that back. Um, getting back to your question about, uh, from the industry side on, on uh, in, you know, international collaboration, one of the things that I think is, is fascinating, at least we see on the defense side, is that many countries like to specialize in certain types of things within the supply chain. Some of them are wing manufacturers. Some of them do avionics. Some of them build landing gear. Some of them build interiors. And they, and, but that is their niche capability. They are very good at it. They have a supply base that allows them to break that technology and then integrate and then allow uh, US companies that are relatively large to buy that from the supply chain and then integrate it into the larger whole. So if I were a country and I was looking to build a space program, I don't necessarily need to build, need to be an independent spacefaring nation. I can be part of a space supply chain that allows me to integrate into the larger, larger whole. Last, last example I'll use. I grew up in West Virginia. And so uh, in my hometown, there was a, we had this company called Honeys and Alloys. Uh, we called it the nickel plant, but it was called Honeys and Alloys. Well, uh, that company built the space shuttle tiles. And uh, for somebody that, that had never seen, a, never seen a launch, had only looked up at the night sky and was, you know, was very interested in this, I was proud of the fact that right down the street was this company that was providing this thing that was going to space. And I use that example because internationally, it, that's a great example. If a country wants to develop a supply chain, train its people, identify those suppliers, and and be part of a supply chain that can be used by not only U.S. companies, but also other companies that are that are may not be U.S. based, that are sending people to to the moon and to Mars. Then we should do that. So, excellent point. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Let's uh, turn to some questions from the audience. Let's see, is there a, a mic that? Yep. Hi there. Thank you, everybody. Um, great panel. I have a, a question. So we've talked a lot about the heavy investment from both states and private actors, but we've also heard from other speakers and panelists about threats and challenges to our national security in space. So I was just wondering, what are the initiatives, what are the goals um, from each of your perspectives about how to keep space as a peaceful domain for all of mankind? So, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, so uh, I would say within the department, we have a number of, number of offices that work on the security issues. Uh, we, that's not my office, although we work, we work closely with them. Um, certainly the U.S. was, was watching closely the, um, the, eight, the ASAT test recently in India. And I would say my office, um, principally we've been engaged through, the, through COPUS, the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, on long-term long sustainability of space. Uh, so make sure that um, countries are engaging in space in a responsible manner um, and uh, putting in guidelines in place for that. Um, other offices work through other, as other parts of the UN, the UN First Committee, to talk about various security issues. Um, and uh, I guess I'll, 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 I'll leave it there and turn to one of my panelists. So yeah, and, and, and um, you know, I represent the civil space at the National Space Council, but we have a defense um, policy expert. Um, and as you know, uh, we had Space Policy Directive 4, which was the um, initiation of the Space Force. And that alludes to the fact that there is a war fighting domain in space. Now, it's not, you know, what you think. We're not having people you know, up in space, you know, fighting each other for territory of, of space. Um, it's more, you know, we have nations who are in conflict and using space as, as that domain. And that's a real thing. That, that's, that's, in, um, that's a reality we have to live with. Um, I think we are taking you know, the, the, the measured steps to, to deal with that. Um, and we have a strong defense that is looking to make things peaceful. Um, I, that's always the goal. So, you know, there's a reality and then there's the ideal. Um, I think the ideal is still to have peaceful um, use of space, and so that's why we have a separate civil space agency. I mean, you know, you could, it could be worse if we, if, or it could be different if we had, um, you, know, you know, those things not separated, but we have those things separated, so we have an opportunity for peaceful use of space um, while we still deal with the threats. But the threats are reality, and we have to, have to work through those. Question on the side. Okay, thank you all for an excellent panel. Mosami san, thank you very much for educating me on JAXA. And now, Chris, I'm going to put you in the hot spot. All right.
Charles Bolden, when he was administrator of NASA, he would come here every year, and the question would always come up, why isn't China on the ISS? And he'd always scratch his head, he said, I'm open to the idea, like, with a lot of qualifications, of course. But then he said, the State Department has me handcuffed. I can't do anything before them. What's going on with China, the China Space Program and the State Department? And generally, what would they have to do to be, get themselves in a position where they would be allowed to cooperate with us? Oh. <laughs> I'll, pull, I'll pull out my, my standard talking point here. Uh, <laughs> and it's, I, yeah, State Department, we get, um, it's not, well, um, so the department in cons consultation with Congress, and this is, this is very important because Congress has a very big say on what the executive branch can and cannot do uh, with China. Um, there are specific, as you very likely, well likely know there are specific restrictions placed on NASA, um, which does put my department in, in place to host uh, a civil space dialogue with China. And we've, we've been doing that for about five years. We're planning to hold another dialogue uh, later this year. Um, and in, the, in that, uh, that venue, it's principally an information sharing. So we, we talk about our plans, China talks about their plans. And our, our real focus is on uh, space flight safety and also on transparent behavior in space. And that gets a little bit more into the security issues. Um, but um, be, beyond that, um, you know, discussions, we, we talk with the Chinese. We certainly talk with China in uh, multilateral venues and copulous. Uh, they're actually quite, quite helpful there. Um, but. Um, They'll, it'll take uh, a number of decisions uh, I, to move forward any, with the White House and Congress to do anything further. And I'll, and I'll add to that, um, you know, we anticipate this question always, right? So we, we, we know that this is an issue that people are interested in. Um, you know, the formulation from the U.S.-China summit says that we're open to cooperation that is reciprocal, transparent, and mutually beneficial. So those are three key items, and that's where the challenge is with China today. Um, so we also recognize that um, space cooperation follows and reflects. It does not lead or drive the overall nature of international relationships. So, you know, NASA can't lead what the, the nation hasn't already identified as a cooperative op opportunity. So when those things come to reality, then we can, we can work collaboratively. In the meantime, um, you know, if, if we can share data from missions, um, that does happen. You know, there's opportunities for that. So we just got to find, um, identify areas in which those can, can exist. And for now, that's not in the human domain, but maybe someday. Thank you. Thank you. Question over here. Hi. Uh, thank you guys for this amazing discussion. I think it's really relevant with uh, where space is today and becoming a global society. Um, earlier, you mentioned the importance of technology from countries like Canada and Australia being used in, in uh, a global effort for um, sp space missions. Uh, are there any efforts? to encourage smaller countries that might feel left out or might feel that they have higher priorities um, other than space? Are there any efforts to encourage them to become part of the supply chain and to provide whatever trade skills or expertise that they could? Yeah. Um, so what I would say is uh, it's a two-way street. So not only do uh, countries have to identify that they want to be part of that supply chain, but uh, the U.S. industry needs to identify that they have a gap that they have to fill. And when we deal with uh, supply chain related issues on the industry side, it is, it's actually pretty difficult because you have to evaluate not only the supplier base, you have, to, you have to identify whether that workforce is able to absorb the requirements that you have to in order to integrate into the, into the supply chain. Um, but also, you know, I, we, take, we might be able to take a cue here from some of the security cooperation policy of the United States government, where there are some countries where they want to develop certain technologies or certain capabilities in certain countries on the defense side. There's no reason to say that we couldn't do that on the space side as well. Um, I, th I don't know if we're, there, we're, we're quite there yet, but it provides a relatively good model. In, or, in, or, in order for us to think about that. But, but smaller countries need to consider whether they want to be part of the space industrial base. And frankly, I think many of them would want to be uh, with support from uh, US industry and also the US government. 
Well, unfortunately, it looks like we're out of time. I know that there are a lot of more questions. Uh, and so I believe that there is a social media opportunity as well to submit questions in. Um, but I do want to thank our panelists today. Please join me in thanking them for some great, great insights.